Welcome to the NRDC Impact Lounge at the 2022 Sundance Film Festival. I'm Daniel Heinerfeld, director of NRDC's Rewrite the Future, an initiative that helps Hollywood tell stories about climate change and environmental justice. I am so honored to be here today with the moderator of our discussion, Zassi Bates. I'm Zassi Bates, an actor and climate activist, and I'm very happy to be here as part of the 2022 Sundance Film Festival. We have a once in a generation moment to set the course for a better future for people worldwide. One that is clean, healthy, equitable, and prosperous. And all of you, the storytellers, have a unique and an essential role to play. Good stories have the power to reach not just our minds, but our hearts, to move us, to help us envision a better future, and to inspire us to fight for it. Throughout history, We've seen the entertainment community use the power of stories to push our society forward on a wide range of issues. As the climate crisis intensifies, so does our need to tell stories about it. Stories that sound the alarm, that highlight climate injustice and intersectionality, and that envision solutions. Stories about climate heroes who are leading the way to a better future. We need these stories in part to help us explore our own complex emotional reactions to the climate crisis. Because climate change isn't just happening to the outside world. It's happening to each of us on an emotional and psychological level as well. We thank Sundance for this platform where storytellers can explore how to create cultural change. And we thank our wonderful collaborators, my friend Anna Jane Joyner and the Good Energy Project, the Sundance Institute, Writers Guild of America East, Variety, and Yeah Impact. Thanks so much to all of you for being here. Back to you, Zassi. I'm very excited to moderate this discussion. It has been profound for me to realize the full impact the climate shift has had in our lives. It has almost fully encompassed every decision that I make in my own life. What food I buy, what clothing I buy, my travel habits, what stories to pursue in my work, where to invest, who to vote for, what neighborhoods to live in when factoring climate risk and what this all will mean for my ch future children and the guilt that that comes with, because I, I want to have children, uh, but I, you know, I feel guilt about that desire. Um, so all of these elements compounded together make the experience overwhelming, and we're all going through this at the same time. So here to talk about this is an illustrious panel of experts. Dr. Britt Ray is a human and planetary health postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where she researches the mental health impacts of climate change. Her forthcoming book, Generation Dread, investigates the psychological underpinnings and impacts of the climate crisis. Narain Shankar is the executive producer and showrunner of the critically acclaimed television adaptation of the science fiction novel series, The Expanse. Noreen spent eight seasons as a writer and executive producer and co-showrunner of CSI Crime Scene Investigation, which is the most watched show in the world. Finally, Scott Z. Burns is a screenwriter, director, and producer. His work in film includes producing the Academy Award-winning documentary An Inconvenient Truth. He's currently creating an anthology series entitled Extrapolations, which explores the ramifications of climate change and the future of humanity. Welcome, everybody. Let's go right in. Uh, Britt, uh, what is climate anxiety and how do you see it impacting people, especially the young? Yeah, climate anxiety is a term that's used to describe the distress that a person might feel when they reckon with their awareness of the severity of the climate crisis and what it's threatening to do to people and species and wild places, both now already and in the future. And it often gets lumped in with expressions of overwhelm at the scale of how bad this problem is that we must learn to move on in, uh, grief about what's being lost, and terror about how awful things could get given in action. And it's typically intensified because people are aware that decision makers and leaders are not doing nearly enough to prevent that from happening. And young people are unsurprisingly bearing the brunt of it. It's disproportionately showing up in their lives because they're aware of this threat. They've grown up under the specter of the climate crisis and often are 
uh, reckoning with these feelings before they've had the opportunity to take up their places in society and find out personal aspects of their identity and other kinds of wayfinding missions that we all go through in our lives. And that can be incredibly oppressive to have this hanging over you while you're trying to do those other human tasks. And older people seem to be checking out of here before things really hit the fan and they feel like adults have left the building and are giving them the responsibility to clean it up. Have you personally, or what are, what are your sort of feelings around the climate? You know, I have studied conservation biology. Witnessing the sixth mass extinction of non-human species has brought me a lot of grief over the years. Working as a science communicator, covering the climate beat has been incredibly uh, intense. You know, just bearing witness to the loss and bearing witness to the lack of action when we have very clear science that tells us what to do and solutions is a incredibly frustrating position to be in. And uh, to pick up on your point about kids, I felt incredible anxiety uh, over this dilemma of whether or not to have a kid because for a long time I've been really wanting to and facing that decision was just incredibly hard to make and it actually inspired my forthcoming book which is about the emotional aspects of the climate crisis, Generation Dread, as I tried to reckon with these feelings and I, I actually ended up having a baby. I have a newborn at home, but that whole process is something that a lot of people are grappling with right now. And, you know, they're being challenged to face some really difficult emotions and decisions when facing an uncertain future. It's a rough time. I mean, you know, we're, we're at that point where you can think back to when you were a kid and how different the world felt, how different summers felt, how different, you know, winter felt. You know, we, my, my wife and I live in Los Angeles and and fire season, what used to be like a, a portion of the summer, now feels like it's all year long, you know. And my my little brother lives up in Vancouver, and and he was just you know part of all of the gigantic flooding, and and that was after the gigantic heat dome. And everybody says, oh my God, these things never happen, and now they're happening all the time. And I think that that's why I mean it's one of the big reasons that this is on people's minds, and it feels really emotional because people even if they can't articulate it, they can sense that the world is different. They can sense that things are changing. And you put that word to it and it does generate enormous anxiety because the world is a big place. You know, what, what is small me going to do to change the gigantic weather systems or the climate of a city? It's like, that's the helplessness that comes with it. And so, you know, I think that drives a lot of the anxiety and everybody feels it. I mean, no, none of us are immune to it. For me, I think what I've become aware of mm -hmm. is we tend to get really caught up in a, in a continuum that I think is false, which is this hope versus non-hope um, kind of description of how someone might react to this. And to follow on what Britt said, I think to me, the issue is really the continuum is action versus inaction. Um, people a lot smarter than me have always said that hope is not a strategy. Um, and as a storyteller, I really am trying to escape that sort of, you know, dichotomy that, that the studios and the people who have the financial resources that allow us to tell stories tend to push us towards, which is please tell hopeful stories. And I don't think that's the right way to explore this issue. I think looking at stories um, in a different world is, is really the only way now I know how to do this at this point, which is there are things that are going to change in the world, whether they're about wild places or about where we live and how we live and what we eat. So creating believable stories within those worlds um, and exploring those anxieties and the feelings that they, they provoke are really, I think, the job that's in front of all of us and not succumbing to what I think starts to turn into propaganda when you start saying you gotta be hopeful. I think the audience isn't gonna give you a pass. So you need to be entertaining. You need to be compelling. You need to create really great characters. Do you, any of you think that there's a stigma around talking about the emotions we have with the climate crisis? I'll take a stab at that, I guess. Um, you know, I, I think it depends. There are people who are, you know, 
well off. I mean, Hollywood gets accused of this quite a bit, right? You say, oh, that's very easy for wealthy liberals to say, you've got to do this and you have to give up that and you have to change your life. That's not an option for a lot of people in the world. Um, and so I think that's, you know, that's part of the problem. We have lots of we have lots of problems talking about science these days. We have a lot of problems talking about facts these days. We have, you know, a, a political system that sort of stands in the way of even basic agreement on simple things, let alone getting to significant policy decisions. That's a rough environment to be in. And so it feels like you're incapacitated on that level. You're incapacitated emotionally, and that puts people into a state of paralysis. That's a hard place to be. Brit, how do you approach uh, people who have climate anxiety? How do you help them or, or speak to them? It's really important to know that climate anxiety is not a disorder. It's actually reasonable and rational and caring to feel this response. And so we can be proud of feeling these ways. Uh, it's a sign of our compassion and our humanity. But if it becomes so overwhelming that it causes us to start to lose functioning and just our ability to get through the damn day, then of course it's a problem and it requires specialized forms of support. And this can come in many forms. I mean, there's now informal drop-in climate emotion groups that you can go to like climate awakening, but there's also just friends who get it and people who won't say, don't be so dire, you're fine. Whoa, that is wow. a sensor. Uh, mm -hmm. External activism still really matters. So coming together to take those actions so that helps you live in alignment with your values, which can also bring some relief. I, I agree with you. And like, I think it's very important to find community and people who get it and can validate your feelings. But what do you do if say you live with family who is just not getting it? It's such an important question because so many of us are trying to navigate this, even surrounded by our circle of loving friends and family yeah. who are not trying to be antagonistic, but they're just not getting it. And it's actually making it worse, right? <laughs> For navigating the anxiety. And I think we all need to find ways of communicating more wisely with one another around the climate crisis, first and foremost. So not bashing each other over the head with facts or trying to just um, pump up hopeful and positive solutions only to get people on board, but really allowing for connection, for understanding what's valuable or to that other person, what they believe in and starting from there, from a, a place of human connection rather than um, this combative thing that we get wrapped up in so easily. Also like give yourself a break and understand that these feelings are disenfranchised still by the society at large, right? And I think that's a good point. Um, it's not necessarily bashing somebody over the head with everything, but figuring out creative ways to um, make these ideas either sort of the background, the setting, or the, the main plot of something. Um, or what do you think is the reason we don't see more climate stories in film and TV? It's a tough thing to put into drama because it's a gigantic slow moving problem without an easy solution like you know like blowing up an asteroid it doesn't have that kind of solution to it so it tends not to lend itself to the kinds of dramas that people are used to you know it's not like a simple technological fix although as scott was saying that's what they always want you to do it's like that's like yes i can't can, can they fix it at the end it's like well um you know that's not an easy problem and so i think that's part of it and and it is you know, dealing with, you know, realistically with the effects of these things, the knock is, oh, that's a downer. You know, you're, you're, you're talking about highly dystopian environments. You're talking about a very difficult thing that sort of hits you in a, in a very dark place. And I, I think those are the things that are stacked against it in terms of, you know, in terms of crafting stories around it. That makes it, that makes it a real challenge. You know, uh, a couple of years ago, I met uh, a writer named Amitav Ghosh, who wrote a book called The Great Derangement. What I love about Amitav's work and, and his essay um, is that he really, you know, kind of points out that so far we've dropped the ball um, on the great story of our time. You know, when you look at, you know, the, the writers who came after World War II, although clearly there was a problem with the telling of World War II through the eyes of, of men almost exclusively. But we told those stories of our time and, and a lot of the understanding of World War II came through the work of cinema in Europe. We have largely failed um, as a storytelling community. And I think it's exactly 
um, you know, for that reason, that the this, this studio has a hard time identifying a story. There is this, you know, observation which largely goes unchallenged that something that is, you know, suggestive that things may become more challenging, um, that, that, that things are not getting better is hopeless and will turn people off. There is a lot of historic guidance about ways to behave in the face of, of great challenges. And that frequently in that crucible, you find heroes um, and you find non-heroes, but everyday people trying to figure out a way to live in a changing world. And so to me, again, the exercise, and I think what's great about the challenge that, that Amatov made in The Great Derangement is can we find compelling stories? And the answer is obviously yes, we always can, that take into account a changed world and ask characters, how do I behave? You know, the stories are all around us because they're all set in our world and our world is in fact changing. And I also wanted to ask for you as somebody who's been, you know, you created and you made it in Convenient Truth, you've been sort of in the climate conversation for so long. Have you felt kind of any sense of it's the same thing over and over and people aren't listening or do you feel like there's change happening? Well, I think just like there's climate anxiety, there's certainly fatigue mm -hmm. for people who have been in this, you know, for a long time. Um, I now feel really old. Um, <laughs> no, so, uh, um, thanks for that. Uh, you know, I feel that we have an incredible opportunity to to change the landscape. I mean, I think it's really important that we not just hear <clears throat> from, you know, white male content creators, because one of the things that becomes increasingly apparent, as you said, is that this is a justice issue. Um, and it's visited on frontline communities first and indigenous peoples first. Yeah. And so the knock on effects of, of climate change, whether you're looking at the loss of entire islands in the Pacific um, or a host of other issues, whether they're health related, food related, property related, they're everywhere. So climate is an intersectional issue. Uh, what does that mean for climate storytelling and climate emotions? We are all coming at this very differently. You know, often the conversation around climate anxiety still reveals its own amnesia because it's being framed as though it's just for people who have the luxury of dreading the future, a climate changed future, rather than those who already because of existing oppression and marginalization, understand marrow deep how unsafe the world can be, right? So only some of us are being faced with existential threat for the very first time, and that has so far often been lumped in with the discourse around climate anxiety, um, which makes it seem like it's a white person problem or only for the, the worried well, so to speak. However, uh, recent research has shown that this is really not the case. <laughs> so um, some colleagues and I, uh, recently did a survey of 10,000 children and young people around the world and in some of the most climate vulnerable countries who are already experiencing direct impacts, whether we're talking about Philippines or Nigeria or Brazil, young people report really high climate anxiety in those places and, and more than in other more protected areas. And this makes sense uh, because of course, if you're more directly threatened, you're going to be aware and distressed by it. However, the language might be failing us, right? It's not necessarily that climate anxiety becomes the choice term to describe one's distress if you know, police violence or systemic racism or the ongoing intergenerational trauma of colonization or sexual violence or these other things are preying upon you, often in more practical and immediate ways or at least in ways that are co-appearing with the climate crisis anxiety. So it's, it's a much more nuanced discussion than this kind of knee-jerk reaction that has emerged of, of saying, you know, climate anxiety is just for those who are privileged and protected and, and away from the front lines. It's anyone can feel climate anxiety if they're aware of how their health is tied up with the health of the environment. And, and that's what's playing out. And just to, to finish also, um, Yale Climate Communications found that communities of color in the United States are more alarmed, they're more concerned about the climate crisis than their white counterparts. And they're also more likely to take part in environmental justice movements, right? And this also tracks, of course, because 
it's personal. Yeah. I was going to ask if you felt like um, people who are um, sort of in the direct line of fire of, of everything that's going on with the with the climate, um, if often they feel they have less agency or if not. And I feel like in this case, um, as you just mentioned, um, it actually it activates people. Yeah. Um, and um, yes, I, I found that very interesting. What do you all think goes on psychologically or emotionally for oil executives? or people who in power who actively um, sort of make, you know, even legislative decisions on, on, um, on what's affecting the climate. Do you think that's grist for storytelling? You know, people forget this, but the first George Bush said that I'm going to make the White House the greenhouse and that they were going to commit to a great greening. Now, that was the Republican Party, you know, 30 some years ago. So John Sununu made the observation, hey, we can get a lot more money if we pursue the oil lobby. It's an incredible story about how the oil companies and the Republicans joined hands 30 years ago to drag their heels and participate in a campaign of misinformation, um, exactly like the cigarette companies did. And so, yeah, there are certainly people who, who work in those industries who have, I think, great great moral and ethical dilemmas that should be spoken about. I desperately want to believe that there are some people out there who have great qualms. And I think there are other people who, you know, who really drink the Kool-Aid of that culture. And by the way, you know, it's not just the oil companies, you know, mm -hmm. I think as time goes on, we'll see that there's a part of tech that really is solving the problem and a part of tech that is training us to believe that technology is in fact the answer. There's a, there's a great line from the, uh, the Simpsons. It's uh, to alcohol, the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. It's like substitute technology for alcohol. And that's sort of the, you know, that's the American ethos. It's like, we always want that big technological solution on the horizon because you've seen it happen over and over again. I mean, like to take a little hope in certain places, I never thought I would see like this move to mass electrification for automobiles. I, I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing that that's happened. Um, so I think there's possibilities for that, but on the balance, um, you know, you got a lot of people who are protecting their own interests and short-term economic interests. And that's a hard thing to break people out of. It really is. I'm interested to see if, the success of Don't Look Up will shift, I think, how sort of larger studios or, or people who are financing films um, will think of sort of audience reception around climate. Because I think a lot of people felt rather validated and I actually cried at the end. Uh, so for me, it was effective. I'm curious what you all think about it from the perspective of climate storytelling and emotions and your own personal reactions to this film, if you had the opportunity to um, to watch. I, I plan on voting for it for best documentary. Um, I think it's the <laughs> best climate documentary that anyone's made in a, in a very long time. Yeah, I think that to see the scientists reckoning with the psychological toll that their research findings are having was super important, not just for those in the climate movement, but increasingly everyday folks, right? They do think that creating content sort of focusing on the heavy feelings around the climate is important. I also believe it's imperative to be realistic and recognize that audiences can become fatigued when everything is only presented as like sad and gloomy. And I think that Don't Look Up ha sort of has this interesting blend of like anxiety, rage, and comedy. And I feel like climate com communicators were begging someone to try by comedy for so long and and finally someone did it at a really big pop culture level and uh it's so refreshing to see there seems to be a range of climate denial from those who think climate change is a hoax to those of us who know it's real but don't necessarily act like humanity is in peril um 
yeah, what do you think is the role of climate anxiety in in denial, I suppose? Yeah, denial is a really fascinating and complex thing. It doesn't just show up in the way that we've been taught through the media to think of it in terms of folks who think climate change is a hoax. Denial is a much softer process that many of us unwittingly participate in all the time when we have one eye open to how horrible this is and then one eye closed in order to allow us to keep on living comfortably and not take responsibility and make big uncomfortable changes, right? And that's called disavowal. Of course, right now, this is a big um, threat to ourselves that we can pretend ourselves away from the responsibilities that we have to take right now. But even more disturbingly now, climate anxiety can lead towards doomsayer mode, right? Like the nihilism that says that it's too late to do anything that matters in this scenario. It's really when we don't have an awareness of the climate anxiety, when we're not creating spaces to process it, when we're not you know, allowing the feelings to move through us and value them, that climate anxiety can be problematic for furthering denial, denial of options of action that still matter, or denial of the fact that we all have a role to play right now and um, should get our head out of the sand. Noreen, uh, your show, The Expanse, has some dark climate references. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you've engaged with the climate themes on the show? I think a lot of what we did in in that series was we sort of, uh, it's not really a dystopian show, but it's not certainly not utopian. Mm-hmm. We explored ideas um, about climate and environment using people who lived and worked in space in the asteroid belt. So issues of scarcity about just not having water or oxygen, um, the need to grow all of your food in vats. There was no real meat. There was, everything had to be grown in a vat. Things were, many things were based on mushrooms. It was like, so we used this sort of inhospitable climate of living in space to talk about those issues, to talk about, you know, um, industrialization and, you know, resource scarcity, we sort of kind of did it by analogy. Um, And Earth was, you know, a part of that. Um, And the way we characterized Earth was in the background, sort of the distant backstory of the show, the only reason Earth had a unified government was because of a massive climate crisis that forced people to work together. Do you, how do you, how do you feel like audiences have reacted to that? Do you feel like, um, or sort of, yeah, what was, has been experience with that? I think, I think those mes- messages were like stealth messages, right? So people responded to them emotionally. We had a character who was, um, who had been born and raised on, a, on, in, on Mars and sort of underground when, and the whole purpose of Mars was to terraform Mars into a second earth that was kind of beautiful and, you know, Eden-like she comes to earth and the thing she wants to see more than anything is the ocean. Just this idea of that broad expanse of water, um, not being able to, to experience that firsthand. And in the show, she comes to earth and she ends up going through a sewer pipe and she ends up kind of in the, you know, the East river uh, outside of New York, which is just kind of yucky. And she looks at it and she says, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And so, you know, there's a, so that's a, if you think about it, that's sort of like, eh, by analogy, you can sort of draw, um, you know, a, a certain kind of feeling to the kinds of things we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, Scott, can you talk us through your forthcoming show, Extrapolations? Yeah, I mean, as I kind of mentioned earlier, you know, the idea of extrapolations came from repeatedly being told that, you know, that this was my problem because I'm a storyteller and we have to come up with different stories if we're ever going to change. And a a question I have for everybody that I meet is, you know, one of the rarest things I think we ever encounter in nature is an adult changing their mind about anything. And so, (laughs) you know, I wish I knew the magic recipe that made people change their minds. But if everybody else has decided it's stories, great, I'll go with that. Rather than, you know, putting our show so far in the future that it was very dismissible, what we decided was to kind of make a trail of breadcrumbs where we did near, near-term near speculative fiction. So we start, you know, 15 years from now, um, and 
we built a world that's going to look a lot like our world. Because if you drive around today, you're going to see buildings that are 100 years old. And you also see buildings that were, you know, are just being finished. And that hopefully we can overcome the barrier to distancing yourself from a different world. You know, um, my, my writing partner on our show is a really amazing writer named Dorothy Fortenberry. And Dorothy always says, you know, the real science fiction shows are the shows that are going to be created that don't take into account climate. That's what science fiction is. What we're doing is trying to look at the world as all of the science tells us it will be um, and create stories in that world. We're all embarking on a big adventure together in the next 40, 50 years. All right. And so I don't know, you know, how it's gonna end any more than I had any instinct, like any instincts about, you know, COVID when I wrote Contagion. All I've done is look at the research and try and extrapolate about how the world might look. And the big question is, we're all going there together. Are we gonna solve this or not? Yeah. And hopefully that is a provocative enough proposition for the marketing people at Apple to, to get people to watch our show. Um. What is the psychological impact of approaching this topic with levity? Like, is it appropriate to do that? I firmly think that comedy is not only appropriate here, but it's beautiful and it's needed. It lowers people's defenses. You know, it makes them feel some positive affect coursing through their body for once about this crisis and allows them to kind of come closer <laughs> and see for a variety of folks who might just keep it at an arm's distance, always resisting uh, the, the dark feelings encroaching because they fear that they'll overtake them if they really open the door and, and confront it fully. It's another way in, right? The climate crisis is not one thing, right? Like it taps into su people's suffering 100%, but it also taps into people's joy because we're also remaking the world at this time and trying to imagine better futures, different futures, ways of connecting and supporting one another through this. You know, some people talk about it like Joanna Macy from the great unraveling to the great turning that we're in the process of trying to bring forth. So we need those things that buoy us up, that bring joy, that allow us to relax a bit. And it's also just natural because the climate crisis is so intensely overwhelming in that it touches everything. And so, of course, it's, it's going to rub up against all human emotions. We don't just have to look at the challenging ones when we're talking about it. Um, I... I am all for more comedy in this particular subject because I agree with with everything that Brett was was just talking about because it is it does lower your defensive it lets you engage with it in a totally different way and it's like I I've been primarily a drama writer my entire career but I think it takes you know um, it takes a particular touch to to hit comedy in that way because like um, think about like you know from a different era Doctor Strangelove is a very very funny movie. It is also a terrifying movie at the same time. Um, and when you can engage with something like that, I think it's really kind of interesting if you can pull it off. Um, <laughs> I like your lighting shift when that happens. It's pretty know, cool, it's actually. Very, very, very <laughs> As though it's not ominous enough that we're talking about all this. <laughs> and it just goes back. Um, I think in some ways, this conversation is for writers and creators. So like, what are different sort of ideas of, of I don't know, climate stories, uh, I guess that don't just like focus on weather that, that aren't, yeah, just focused on there's a tornado. Um, yeah, millions out of there. <laughs> there are, there are so many of those. Um, the process on our show is we sort of looked at the science. We spoke to, you know, everyone from, you know, Elizabeth Colbert about animals um, and extinction to people about geoengineering, um, which I think is something we all are going to have to grapple with very soon. You know, we have, a, we have an episode with Meryl Streep that, that looks at extinction. We have uh, an episode that looks at climate related birth defects, which are probably going to become more prevalent as time goes on as women experience part of their pregnancy during extreme heat. We look at sea level rise. I can't um, wait to watch this. We look at technology and we look at, you know, whether or not we can figure out a way to remove carbon. You know, is that the great technological solve? 
you know, we've, we've tried to look at rather than the big cataclysmic thing, which we probably couldn't have afforded to do anyway in a TV show, um, and instead look at the human effect. Um, and we do a lot of stuff with, with, with kids and parents, because when you look at a lot of the speeches that have been made, we tend to spend a lot of time saying, let's do this for our kids, which is a great idea. Um, but if you talk to a lot of kids, it actually really turns them off because um, they'd like to know what we're going to do. Really, the legacy that I think our kids would like from us is a legacy of action and a legacy of recognition of this moment. What sort of real sacrifice are we going to make um, in the hope of finding comfort in other ways? I think that hope and finding solutions can often be uh, conflated as one. Uh, what do you think on that? Like, do you think um, there is a way to make content that is sort of gears and creates solutions without necessarily um, um, you know, making it feel like this is sort of like a hallmark version of how things can end. <laughs> the idea of showing real human emotions in different environments, like the, the act of raising a child in a very changed world, that idea I think is very, very powerful. Um, you know, because what you're doing is you're letting the audience actually make the connection that their lives are gonna change very profoundly or their children's lives are gonna change very profoundly. So within that changed world, you can express hope, you can express love, you can express loss, you can express a million things um, without beating somebody over the head or making it into a hallmark moment. But what it allows you to do is it allows people to really think about um, how their lives might be very, very different uh, if these things go the way they could go. I think we need them all. We need all the emotions to show up in these stories because there is no secret sauce to getting people to change their mind, as Scott said, or you know, producing behavior change. Different people are motivated by different emotions. I think they all need to be valued rather than this really stale old debate about hope versus fear that we've been stuck in for a really long time. You know, we owe the audience you know, entertainment but we also owe them, you know, the truth, if that's the nature of the genre we're participating in. To me, the continuum needs to not be, you know, hope versus hopelessness or hope versus bleak. It's got to be action versus inaction. And also when it comes to hope specifically, like the hope versus hopelessness, I think we're being challenged to appreciate that we're sitting in the middle and we need to have a non-binary approach to these emotions. It's not one or the other, right? We're like sitting in that space between and it's in that gray space that the interesting stuff happens. Um, and insofar as solutions are there through action um, and through, you know, the wild leap of being a human being, you know, if, if, you, if you give up, um, then of course, you know, Climate fatalism gives you your, your ending. Um, but if you, if you participate, if you get involved, um, then there's boundless solutions. So that to me is, that's, that's the first answer is, you know, don't give up. Great, well, thank you so much. Um, thanks to three of you uh, for giving us your time today and your thoughts in order to make change. I think we do have to continue to be creative. So thank you. And finally, thank you Sundance Film Festival for hosting this conversation. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Hi, my name is Anna Jane Joyner and I'm the founder of The Good Energy Project. I'm Claudia Eller, Editor-in-Chief of Variety. Hello, my name is Dana Weissman and I'm the Director of Programs at the Writers Guild of America East. Hi everyone, my name is Samuel Rubin and I am your yeah, Impact Co-Founder and Chief Impact Officer. We support screenwriters in weaving climate into television and film. 
We're producing the first ever climate storytelling playbook for screenwriters, which will launch in April of 2022. I started Good Energy because great stories are vital to finding courage to face climate change. But I also started it for a much more personal reason. I need these stories. I'm sitting here today on the Gulf Coast of Alabama, which is my family's ancestral home, uh, and it's also on the front lines of climate change. Having worked on climate for 15 years now and lived on the front lines of climate, I've struggled at times with climate anxiety and grief. I know that seeing climate on screen will help millions of people like me. Thank you to our panelists for this great conversation and to Sundance for supporting critical conversations like this. And most of all, thank you for being here today. Climate change is an existential crisis that Variety has continued to shine a media spotlight on for several years. Our 2019 special issue, Climate in Crisis, galvanized our commitment to raising global awareness of the dire need to save our planet, posing the question of whether Hollywood was really doing enough to sound the alarm by mustering all of its storytelling power. With our sustainability and Hollywood events, we're devoted to continuing the ongoing conversation around the critical issue of climate change. And we're proud to support events like this one from NRDC's Rewrite the Future initiative that connect and inspire storytellers. Our members are well aware of the urgency of the climate crisis. They're looking for case studies and inspiration, yes, but also for ways to get attention for the scripts that they already have in their brains and or hard drives stories that address climate change in a wide spectrum of ways so that they can sell those scripts and get them out into the marketplace. To that end, we've already partnered with members of the PGA Green to brainstorm ways to get more traction for climate change narratives, and we welcome any input that might help our members to address this enormous challenge. Thank you. Over the past two years, our social impact agency and the Young Entertainment Activist Coalition has elevated Hollywood creative and grassroots climate organizations by providing spaces for culture makers to build collective power and develop intergenerational narrative strategies to tackle our current crisis. That's why we created initiatives like the Hollywood Climate Summit or produce impact campaigns like Can You Hear Us and Youth Pursuit Cup. At YEA yeah, Impact, we are determined to normalize climate storytelling and sustainability behind the scenes, whether it's supporting companies like Scriptation and its revolutionary paperless technology, or Good Energy and Energy's Rewrite the Future by providing showrunners and TV writers the resources they need. 